All right, greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracol here, Adams van Sale, here to shine a light on the goings on down south, but also again, as, as with last week, some ideas that I think that are not only uh, applicable or relevant to the South African context, but also to the wider Western context, specifically in America, as you will uh, hear from my guest uh, later in the show. And tonight's topic for discussion, that particular topic, is the tyranny of just. Now, I understand that title alone doesn't give you too much to deduce on uh, what we're going to be talking about here tonight, but I can guarantee you it's going to be worth your while. And here to join me tonight for that topic is Jay Burden. He's been kind enough to have me on his show in the past, on his YouTube channel, and uh, I thought it was only right to have him on my show to talk about one of his recent pieces that he wrote of the same title as the show here tonight. So welcome on the show, Jay Burden, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on, Ernst. I've said this before in our interview, but you know, in the kind of time before I decided to kind of put my hat in the ring and uh, you know, produce my own content, uh, you've been a favorite of mine for a while, and I've mentioned it before, but you know, you did a a discussion with a, with a friend of yours, you know, talking about the necessity of kind of digging a trench. And, you know, that essay and that podcast in particular was incredibly impactful on me. It's one that I think to, back to often. And so uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you wrote a piece that was uh, impactful on my thoughts as well. So, and that's why uh, I invited you on to elaborate a bit more on it. But uh, maybe just for some context uh, for my audience, um, stop me if you've uh, if any of this sounds familiar. So uh, if you've watched a show like Rick and Morty or perused the, the pages of Reddit, specifically the front page, uh, you'll he have heard one of these lines. Uh, you're just a meat machine piloted by a biocomputer. You're just a microorganism at the bottom of a cosmic gravity well. You're just a speck on a rock hurting through space at the bottom uh, uh, at the bottom of it and the uh, thousands of at a thousand miles per hour love is just a chemical reaction you're just a brain riding a meat bicycle we're just apes uh, with nuclear weapons and uh so on and so on i think you can tell that i like that i grew up in the 2000s but i think many of those would have would have crossed your path even uh, on your side uh jay burden maybe even more in the american context well, well certainly and that was kind of the genesis behind this this piece like i say i really hate talking about these kind of like mass casualty events mass shootings they're just kind of distasteful and, and there's always this rush to you know use the biographical details to kind of like fill out a political punch card and i i, I don't like it but in the wake of one of the recent ones there was this kind of arch female progressive i cannot remember who they're effectively interchangeable uh who said oh this is the one that proves the idea of, you know, the good guy with a gun wrong. You know, you're, you're not a hero. You're just a normal guy. You know, if you were there when it happened, even if you had, you know, if you were armed, you just sit there and, and, you know, soil yourself. And that sort of got me thinking because that, that term just right is sort of this mimetic tool where you can make a technically true statement, right? Like you are a man, I am a man, but, in making an equivocation like A is B, you're sort of bringing it to the lowest common denominator. Like, oh, you're just a man. You know, there, there's nothing more to you than kind of like your your literal characteristics. And I think that kind of that tool, that mimetic virus, is really rampant, and it's used to attack kind of broader civilizational narratives. So in this piece, I talk about how you know this is used to kind of attack civilizational figures and heroes. And kind of recontextualize, quote unquote, you know, those figures, those men, those narratives, and make them seem to be kind of like venial or, you know, kind of low. And, you know, that isn't just, that isn't a neutral thing. You know, that isn't just true history, right? It, it's ideological. And, you know, buried in that, it creates this knock on effect where, you know, when we don't have these higher ideals, these civilizational myths, well, we can't produce heroes. We can't produce quality men anymore. And so to me, I think that, that that line of attack is one that we really have to understand and resist because, I mean, we're living in the consequences of it. You know, I mean, when we have, Lewis would call these men, you know, men without chests, you know, men who have been raised to only believe in that kind of, you know, frame of just, well, you can't get them to do 
you know, dangerous things. You know, the, the, again, I hate to use the example from a shooting, but in, in what happened at Uvalde, you know, where there are dozens of armed men standing essentially outside a building where children are being murdered. And what do they do? You know, they sit on their phones, they check, they wait for reinforcements to arise. And I'm not saying that that's directly because, you know, they grew up in a world, you know, where they watched one too many episodes of Rick and Morty, but that idea is, is pernicious and it produces the kind of results we see now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, this, this goes back to the much older idea of just the role of the, the story or the role of the epic or the role of the legend or the myth is that the, the very specific practical role of producing or not producing rather providing people with these types of figures to aspire to it doesn't it, the same applies to an origin myth or the the origin myth that any people uh starts with or the the myth that uh, kind of creates their genesis what you're sitting with there it, it doesn't even have to be true or false it provides an ideal to strive towards and in our time it feels almost as if even that even looking at some of these stories, the the Reddit response or the the almost knee jerk responses, it's not true. It's just a myth, or it's just a just a story that people made up to manipulate other people. Of course, there aren't heroic figures like this. Have you ever seen a hero like that? Of course not. That it's just a it's just a fantasy. It was used by elites in the past and thought up to manipulate people and so they can do a. Uh, 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 act in a, in a in a certain uh, way that they wanted and everything is just deconstructed to this very cynical level but that that's absolutely not the case what we see throughout history and through the entire spectrum of cultures is that at the bedrock is always a story or a collection of stories or myths true or false or exaggerated that provide that culture or that people or individuals within that community ideals to strive towards and even just even if when you realize that some of these stories or it's revealed to you that some of these stories are not true, that doesn't change the fact that it's still an ideal that you strive towards. A lot of people do it unconsciously even. Um, I think in our time, a lot of people, the films that they watch, now it doesn't even matter how deep or even uh, virtuous the, or the film's uh, script is or some of the ideals within it, but people watch a film like Star Wars and you see how they get completely sucked into that story and they start emulating these characters and they start using, when, when they don't have religion to guide them, they let these stories guide them and say, well... Uh, uh, Lord Voldemort is evil in Harry Potter, and he would have been, he would have supported this ideology. That's why I oppose this ideology today. People do it unconsciously, but the same people, even those people that scoff at these ideas and say it's just myth, it's just things, it it doesn't really matter. It's just things that people made up, are doing it unconsciously in the background as well, or at least that's that's how it appears to me. Well, certainly. And I think some of the confusion from this results from an incorrect assumption we can kind of trace back to the Enlightenment. And that is that man is first and foremost rational. Now, obviously, we have the capacity to reason. That's a very essential skill. I'm not denying that. But my contention is that man is first and foremost a narrative creature. You view yourself mimetically in relation to other things. Now, again, like I said, the capacity to reason is important. I'm not denying that. But, you know, when we look at something like, you know, charging a machine gun nest, you know, doing something dangerous, is that a rational decision for you as a singular individual? I hate to say it, not really, right? But you need to have yeah, this kind of heroic standard to live up to. And this is something that C.S. Lewis talks about often. I've mentioned before uh, at the, the opening chapter to his book, Abolition of Man, which is often referred to as a separate essay by the name of uh, Men Without Chests, you can find it very easily online. Mm. He describes that process and he describes it in, in children's education, you know, through the device of a, of a literature book written for students where they're supposed to pull apart a piece of poetry. But the whole framing is that these kind of higher ideals of truth and nobility, that's just flowery language. Like we're adults, we can skip mm. through that. And yeah. what that communicates is that, you know, all there is, is the kind of like coldly rational, the kind of like mathematical. And once you have that, you create like what he said, men without chests, men with no capacity to feel true and noble things, you know, past the kind of like sheerly biological. And one of the, again, from Lewis, and this is a, a different book, one of his first, uh, it's called uh, Pilgrim's Regress. 
he describes a similar a similar instance. So for those who aren't familiar, this was his first major work after he reconverted to Christianity. It sort of takes the form of uh, you know Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. It's sort of a, a retelling of that story, but it's it's Lewis's own life. And so much like in the original Pilgrim's Progress, there's a scene where our main character is kind of waylaid by a giant and imprisoned. But in this one, you know, the modern retelling by Lewis, the giant has this kind of horrifying power. And this power is to make your skin translucent whenever he looks at you. You can see your bones, your muscles, your blood pumping. And apparently in the story, this is so horrific that it freezes you in place. The giant can, can capture you. And the giant is called the spirit of the age. And this is sort of a, an analogy for Freud, right? And what Freud did is show you something technically true about yourself, right? Man is a, is a sexual being. That's it's inherently true. But from then, that, that kind of truth was a critique that contained a value judgment, you know? And that critique was, that's all that you are. That's just what you are. And just like in the story, that paralyzes you. That makes you unable to see yourself as anything other than this kind of disgusting, you know, amalgamation of, of organs. And obviously in the story, you know, Lewis's analog, John, is, is rescued by, by reason, you know, and the story continues on from there. But I thought that was a very powerful image of the way in which that kind of equivocation and uh, defacing mm -hmm. is is completely completely paralyzing. And one of the things I actually wrote, there's a pair of essays on this, because in the first one, I lay out the problem. And in the second one, I go into like, well, why is this used? You know, why do people lean into that? But I, I think that that one of them right? Is just that there's essentially a, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of sour grapes. You know, someone feels like, well, I'm not living up to a standard. Mm -hmm. So I can't allow there to be a standard, you know? And I think that that's, that's fundamentally the, the wrong way to look at things. Because if we look at the men who built our countries, you know, if we look at the men who accomplished great things, they viewed themselves in relation to a tradition greater than themselves. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a man of the South. I, you know, a big fan of, of Robert E. Lee. And one of the interesting things about him is he was absolutely obsessed with George Washington. He viewed himself in relation to that. He was always feeling like I'm not living up to him. I need to be more like him. I need to work harder. I need to try and kind of emulate my hero. And because of that, he's able to accomplish amazing things because he had this kind of idealized version of someone who came before him. Similarly, he had a, a, a Napoleon infamously was obsessed with Alexander. Right? He was never as good as Alexander. Now, despite the fact that he was a world conquering general, you know, almost without peer, he still viewed himself as a failure in, in relation to that. And obviously this was written kind of shortly after the, the Ridley Scott Napoleon movie, which is sort of a classic example of that tyranny of just, right? Why, why are we focusing on Napoleon? Well, it's not because he conquered the world. You know, he's this great military leader. Well, it's because he had kind of a weird relationship. And that's the thing that's really important. You know, focus on this kind of venial, but technically true, although you could say in that case, it's exaggerated. But my point mm -hmm. stands instead <laughs> of the broader yeah. narrative. And even though it's never directly attacked, that undermines it and you lose that. You create that situation for for men without chests. So sorry, Ernst, I've been I've been going on for about 10 minutes, but that's sort no, of that's uh, it's. No, it's it's good stuff. That's that's the content. That's elaboration on the content of your piece. So I think that that's why I wanted to have you on as well. So you're 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 doing great. So I just wanted to highlight one comment that I found quite amusing. It's Minoan who said, "I find Aaron's accent pleasing yet funny. It's a win." -win. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm I'm very glad that. Uh, well, I, I'm glad Minoan can get uh can get internet in his retirement community. <laughs> I'm glad he could tune in. Excellent. I'm glad that I can uh, get stable internet here and in, uh, at the southern tip of Africa. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to to get back to what you were describing there, you were talking about, for example, uh, an idealized version of, of George Washington. That get, again comes back to that point uh, that I made earlier about it. It really does the 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 acid that that a lot of people in the commentary use to to break that those images or those ideals down is to say, well. What you have here is just an idealized version of a flawed man. Look at all these terrible things that he did. Look at all these terrible things that he said. Look at all these sinful things that he did in his life. And what you, how you should actually be looking at that type of rebuttal is just 
the the yes meme of like yes he, he was a human he was sinful that's that's the human condition you're not going to be able to find a perfect hero out there but not a lot of people have that that outlook a lot of people get confronted by this type of I, I see it as a weak rebuttal but a lot of people get confronted by these types of uh, this type of rhetoric of well look at how terrible all these people that you idolize were in the past uh, people <laughs> just really exposing that they were human but at the same time that works on a lot of people it disenchants a lot of these figures immediately they start feeling guilty a lot of people and start thinking well maybe i shouldn't be striving to, towards being this person uh, trying to be like this person but in the end the bottom line is it doesn't really matter whether that is a true like photographic image of uh, the the man that was or whether uh, that is an idealized version it's the ideal that you're striving towards that is enabling you to be a better person that is enabling you to be better that is in that's challenging you to be a better person or to be a greater man or to achieve more than you have at this point it's the same it's it, but that's a whole i'm not going to get into this but it, it is a, the debate over the noble lie as well it's a theme that's throughout history a debate among the thinkers thousands of years ago already is does there exist something as a noble lie and i think in many cases maybe unwittingly we spread a lot of noble lies about people in the past but as you said idealized versions uh but it's it, it achieves a noble goal it achieves uh, that striving from people that would otherwise not have been there and we see what the absence of that what the absence of that would be like because we live in an age full of acid that is just dissolving all of these great figures from the past trying to uh, reduce them to just their most base characteristics their most like most human moments but in where they've fallen where they've stumbled where they've where they failed and a lot of people fall for it unfortunately well certainly and i think that there there's sort of this category for things that are either kind of technically false or impossible to prove but tell mm -hmm. us kind of broader narrative truth so the example is in the the classic american story of you know george washington cutting down the cherry tree admitting the fact that he'd done it as a young boy, despite the fact he couldn't, couldn't be proven and he was punished for it. The, obviously the, the, the moral of the story is, you know, he was a good and honest man who was willing, you know, even as a child to admit that he had done something wrong and be punished for it. Now, is that true? No idea. No one can verify it either way. But what it does do is impart a sort of civilizational lesson, you know, be like this man. And, and so, again, kind of merely debating things on the kind of like simply factual level, like, don't get me wrong, that that's important. You, know, you, you need to be correct. You shouldn't be you know, kind of like willfully sp spreading mistruths. But it's it's sort of a impoverished way of looking at that story. You know, did, did Arthur really pull a sword out of a stone? Hmm. Probably not. Who knows? You know, but merely getting so focused on these kind of like granular factual issues in comparison to this this wider thing, it's it's incredibly myopic. And again, like the, you see this in these kind of deconstructions is that it reframes the whole discussion of a man, the whole discussion of an era on something that while certainly a picture, a part of it is, is relatively inconsequential. Like the, the example I always think of is like, well, well, was Genghis Khan nice to his mother? You know, and it's like, well, I mean, he may or may not have been, but that's not why we're talking about Genghis Khan. You don't, we don't say like, oh, well, you know, he, he conquered most of the known world. But really, the reason that he matters is that, you know, he was a, he was a, a pleasant and jovial fellow. And this this really is deeply an important thing to, to capture, because one of my my all time kind of literary idols, you know, the man that I look up to greatly is, is Thomas Carlyle. And Thomas Carlyle has kind of fallen out of fashion. He was once considered, you know, kind of an indispensable part of, you know, the Western canon of the Victorians. He was friends with with Dickens, but he, he's sort of been kind of ushered out in favor of more modern or modern authors but he has this this book it's it's heroes heroism and hero worship or, or something like that it's easy to find where he talks about this exact thing and he, he has this line that's amazing it says like hero worship is the basis of civilization which basically means you know that if you have that mechanism to kind of inspire people to live a certain way you know to, to emulate great men that's a civilization mm -hmm. and once that goes away 
the civilization sort of it loses its its spirit, loses its vitality, its its, its vigor. And I think that that's something I, I sincerely want to avoid because I love my tradition. I love my people. And to see them kind of so thoroughly demotivated or demoralized is is genuinely tragic. Mm. Absolutely. And uh, I also, uh, I'm also reminded of um, one of my favorite uh, plays written by an Afrikaner called Impia van Weg Low. It's here behind me. Um, I'm not going to go looking for it now. But it's called Die Held, uh, The Hero. And the, without spoiling too much of it, but I mean, I don't think it's it's a difficult book to find. So I don't think I'm going to be spoiling it for anyone. But it deals with this idea. It goes a bit more to the 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 side of some some things. Some ideal idealized images are better than the real the real gritty reality. And it to put it very simply, if I remember it correctly, I haven't read it in a while. But it, the 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 story ends on an opportunity of for one of the characters. So a character dies and what another character has the opportunity to tell uh the, the the deceased character's son about his father but his son has a incredibly idealized heroic image of his father and this character has the opportunity to shatter that image but with that he will also be shattering what this child will be aspiring to be in his life and he, he doesn't do it and it, it comes back to that there's a whole debate around whether you should uh, tell that uh, in that scenario uh, well it's a fictional scenario in this case but whether you should tell the brutal truth or let that child chase and strive towards that that noble ideal that he has in his mind um but it comes down to to exactly what you're you're describing there as well well i think that there's also there's something to be said that i think there's a difference between kind of you know true and honest scholarship you know, someone who is actually interested in, you know, the, the kind of background details of historical figure. I'm not denying that. But I think that what, what we see in a broader cultural sense is, is not that. It's motivated reasoning. It's, I want to go after this figure. You know, what's the closest thing to hand? You know, what's a way I can attack this narrative? And so, you know, you see this in, and this is one of the reasons that I consistently you know, kind of refer to figures from the, you know, the American Civil War, because this is only relatively recently controversial. And so it's sort of helpful to look back to even, a, you know, just a few decades to when this was kind of part of the, the corpus of American myth. And, and what you see is, right, that the, these kind of facts about these men's life, you know, like, oh, Robert E. Lee owned slaves. It was not particularly well hidden. It was not hard to find. You know, nor was the idea that he waged a war against the American federal government. That was quite well known. But when it becomes sort of a necessary thing, you know, uh, this is a part of a, a narrative we need to destroy and corrupt. Those things become highlighted, you know. And again, I think that it's it's sort of a it sort of must be viewed as that as kind of an explicit attack. And, you know, when we look at why I think this is used so often, I, I think some of it is just like simple animus. You know, I, I think that a lot of a lot of cultural figures are just kind of low minded and enjoy, you know, an opportunity to kind of punish the people they don't like. I guess it's very easy to see in American politics, right, that, you know, for instance, when they took down Lee's statue in, in Richmond, I actually this is a funny connection. I was living, you know a hundred yards away from that statue when I first heard uh, your podcast. It's just a, a weird connection wow. now that I think about that's it. A, that's a strange connection, but a nice bit of synchronicity there. Yeah, I know, really, right? And when it was taken down, well, it wasn't just taken down. It was taken down and sort of ritually humiliated. You know, that, yeah. that face you've seen a half dozen times where it was, you know, struck through, its face cut off, you know, and then a full film crew showed up to watch it kind of melt into the fire. And then it was publicized nationwide. Exactly. You don't do that for, for the reasons of you know new his, new <laughs> new historical scholarship coming to light, mm -hmm. right? That's very clearly animus. It's hatred, and I think that it, it's important to to recognize that as as such. But one of the other things is that we talk about, and we've talked about for the last twenty five minutes, the the importance of having a a positive standard to measure measure your measure yourself against, right? Mm -hmm. 
you know, that you say like, oh, like this is a, a great figure for my people's history. I want to be like him. But conversely, if you're at the top of this heap, you know, you're a, a strong and powerful man and you're thinking, well, I don't, I don't look very good compared to that at all. Like I look like what I am. I look like a crook. But if you can either say, well, I am better because I'm not racist or I'm not this, I'm not that. You can kind of recontextualize that history in a way to make yourself look as a more virtuous man than you are, or consequently not to be compared against a standard you can't measure up to. And look, Yukio Mishima is kind of an odd guy, to put it mildly. I really like his literature. Uh, the Sailor Who Fell from Grace is is a very odd book. I'd recommend it. But nonetheless, he has a, a very insightful view on this from Sun and Steel, which is sort of his like samurai bodybuilding manifesto. And it, he talks about, you know, why people hate heroes. And let me pull it up because I think it's a, uh, I think it's a helpful quote. Oh yes, here it is. The cynicism that regards all hero worship as comical is always overshadowed by a sense of physical inferiority. Invariably, is it a man who believes himself physically lacking in heroic attributes who speaks mockingly of a hero? I have yet to hear hero worship mocked by a man endowed with what might be justly cause, called heroic physical attributes. And obviously, he's talking in a in a physical sense. It it applies to a you know philosophical or, or theological one as well, which is I think that. You know, these men without chest that we have created, it's sort of this self-reinforcing cycle where, you know, when we have robbed people of, you know, this this kind of tradition to bind themselves to, they will naturally not, you know, embody those virtues anymore. It's been taken out of them. And then, you know, looking at yourself and realizing, well, I don't measure up, that's never a comfortable thing, you know, and so it's easier in some ways to, to recast that heroism as naive or as stupid or as something to be embarrassed of. And that's something we also see. Like, you know, you've mentioned this this kind of like popcorn flicks. And one of the things that I really hate, it's been kind of termed millennial writing, you know, is this sort of this recurring punchline, you know, where we, we sort of get 80% of a traditionally heroic or dramatic scene. You know, the hero, you know, walks in, puffs out his chest, and then you know, slips on a banana peel. You know, something undercuts that moment. Like, oh, that was awkward. Kind of wink at the camera. And once or twice, you know, it's a funny joke or you, you know, you, you played a prank on me, but it's recurring enough that I think it, it shows that, you know, the, the, the chattering class is deeply uncomfortable with the idea. We got to cut this guy down to size. Exactly. Right. No one can be truly that it's always got to be a joke or it's got to be a cover for something sinister. And so I think that that's something, excuse me, to be aware of as well is, is the kind of changing way in which we refer to heroes in, in media, because like I said earlier, humans are mimetic. They view themselves in relation to story. And, you know, just like in the sense of, you know, a physical sense, you sort of are what you ingest. Hmm. Now, when you describe that, uh, that type of scene, I think we've, most of us have seen it, but, and you, you discussed this with Oren McIntyre as well, when you were on his channel uh, about the same topic, you were talking about specifically the, the inability of Hollywood writers today of, to write genuine, heroic or virtuous characters, but virtuous in the courageous sense. But do you think that as you describe the, they are unable just because they are themselves uncomfortable with that type writing, that type of character or unfamiliar, then they don't even know how to write that character. Or do you think there's also an element, maybe it's in, maybe it's in the background, maybe they don't act, it's not in their conscious mind, maybe unconsciously realize that that type of character might alienate uh, a quite a lot of audience at this point where they'd rather keep the, the audience lowest common denominator when it comes to heroism. Let's not make them too uncomfortable with a too heroic type of character or something that puts them, makes them feel too bad about themselves. Do you think there's an element of that as well? No, certainly. And I think one of the other things in that is th that media has become truly global, you know, that every narrative must be for, for every place. And, you know, with the biz big Disney properties, this is easy to see, you know, because they, they sell just as many, if not more tickets in, in China and India than they do in, in the West. And so that naturally will create kind of a rounding off of, of the edges, because there is something to a sense in which, you know, there are broadly heroic characteristics. You know, if you, if you look at a Norse hero, an English one, an Italian one, they'll have certain crossovers. 
but I do think that there is there is something of this that is specific to a culture, to a folk, you know. And without those kind of like identifying characteristics, it sort of you sort of lose the definition. So I think that if we're talking about you know archetypes, like what is the archetypal hero? You know, in America, the archetypal hero is something like the cowboy or the mountain man. You know, and we've had multiple versions of this. You know, Nathaniel Hawthorne, it's uh, I can't remember what they call him. I, there's any number of names from even that early, but you know, even John Wayne is kind of a, a reimagined version of that. This kind of rugged individualist, him against you know the world, and other cultures have those as well. You know, like the the Japan, and I mentioned Mishima, but the, the concept of the samurai has certain there's certain crossover there, but it's also very different and specifically Japanese. And you can look into that and say, oh, I admire that. But you sort of can't understand it in the same way. It's not you. It's not part of your kind of cultural like, strata. You need soil. folk heroes. I, I, exactly. And I think that as you know, media becomes globalized, you lose that. You, know, you don't get an American hero. You don't get you know, a, a, a Boer hero. You get mm. you know, generic hero as written by kind you of like- You get Mr. Justice. Yeah, written <laughs> by you know, kind of like vaguely uncomfortable yeah. pencil-necked Hollywood writers. And yeah. so I think you're hundred percent right on both, both counts, you know, that people are, are deeply uncomfortable writing it. And I think that, you know, as we've seen this kind of like degradation, you know, and I believe the degradation has, has hit all segments of society, you know, that we, we are a nation of men without chests. And I think that, mm -hmm. you know, there's a reason when you look at, you know, kind of media from an earlier era, you know, when you look at kind of mass consumption, like the, the classic, you know, black and white Westerns, it seems kind of unsophisticated to us. And I think that's because we've been sort of like poisoned by that, that kind of quote unquote recontextualization that you and I have been speaking about. You know, you kind of can't get that out of you. You know, you can try, and I certainly have attempted to in my own life. I did, But it is sort of one of those things that once that gets into you, it never really gets out of you. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, when you were talking about folk heroes, I mean, it's, I think there's a silver lining. There's a white pole here in that it, those heroes didn't go away. Those stories weren't incinerated. They weren't wiped from the history. They weren't wiped from people's memories. They're just not at the forefront. They're not being told. They're not being shared. So that, that's where the silver lining comes in is that we just need to start telling those stories again. We need to start venerating a lot of these heroes from the past again. And as you correctly identified, you need to identify people that are heroes specifically to your people as well. It makes them so much more relatable to uh, the people that you're going to be telling these stories to. And they're going to have built in the culture of the people that you want to inspire. So you can venerate or you can celebrate heroes from, from other cultures or other countries. I don't think that's impossible. But nothing will ever match a folk hero. Someone, the more local, the better. Even on a national level, I think in the American sense, it also already becomes a bit abstract. I think the more local you can get uh, state level, and then even your, your I don't know exactly what, how the, the states get broken up, I think in counties, if I remember correctly, but the more local, the better, even a hero in your own little town's context. And there's someone here in the chat, Sideliner Opinions, actually gave three great examples of Afrikaner heroes. So Vora Voltemada, um, a man who gave his own life to save him and his horse to save people on a, a sinking ship off the coast of the Cape. Uh, Durki Ace, amazing story. Um, 15 year old during the Great Trek, um, surrounded by Zulu impies and uh, him and his father. And they, they're going to die. And his father says, Get on the horse, run, save yourself. And he refuses to leave his father's side. And he dies by his father's side before, but not before putting up a hell of a fight. And uh, then, of course, Yapi Hreiling. And I'm, I'm going to indulge a little bit, quickly telling the short version of Yapi Hreiling's story. It's such an amazing uh, story. And if we're talking about, if, we, if you and me are going to be talking about, we need to start talking about real heroes again, need to start telling these stories again, I would be remiss if, uh, if I didn't indulge a little bit in just quickly telling this man's story. So Yapi Hreiling during the Second Anglo-Boer War, I can't remember how old he was. I think he was eight years old. He was definitely in primary school between, I think, around the age of eight. So his father is a Boer commando, a commando that's hiding somewhere in the, in, the, in the mountains and the British rock up on his farm. Him and his mother are there 
and the British officer or the Brit, I don't know what his rank was, probably a bit higher than officer. But anyway, comes over to Yapi, little Yapi Khreiling, takes him aside and says, where's your father? He says, I'm not going to tell you. He says, well, uh, I don't think you have a choice. And he puts him up against the a wall. And uh, he says again, where's your father? And little Yapi Khreiling, the little eight-year-old boy, says, I'm not going to tell you. And he says, all right. He orders his men to uh, take aim at the little boy. They're going to kill him by firing squad if he doesn't answer. And he says, this is your last chance. Where's your father? And the little boy looks him straight in the eye, doesn't even have an inkling of emotion on his face and says, I will not tell you. And then this... Um, this English uh, soldier or, or colonel or whatever his rank was pretty much tells his men to put their, their arms down and says, I cannot, uh, I cannot kill a man that I have so much respect for. And then uh, the, the story has a little bit of a twist in the end. So after the war, um, I don't know how this happened, but after the war, this, uh, this English soldier that uh, pretty much put this little boy up against the wall in front of the firing squad, writes a book about his experience during the war and one of his chapters is on this experience on little Yapi Khreiling, the impact or the, the, the influence and the impression that this little Boer boy made on him. And he meets Yapi Khreiling somewhere, I think, in, in the city of Pretoria. He, he, uh, he comes across him and he says, Mr. Khreiling, I, I wrote a book and, and you are featured in it. You made such an impact on me that I had to include you in my book. Here is a is a copy for you. And Yapi Khreiling, now a, a grown man at the time, takes the book, looks at it, uh, hands it back to him and says, I don't want your damn book, turns around, walks away. And that's the that's the very short version of, of Yapi Khreiling, a, a, a child hero in the in the a folk hero in the in the Boer sense. But these these are the types of stories that you that you need to tell and you need to share. Well, and it, I think that it's it's something that's especially kind of vital in, in in dark times, right? In times in which things seem seem grim, because one of the the kind of classic you know American stories is the Alamo, right? Hmm. Which is again it's something like Thermopylae, or, you know, a, a, an instance in when you know everyone was killed to the last man. There were no, I think there was one survivor. I can't remember. Well, we'll just say no survivors for the point of drama, right? And that's, that's a situation in which you have an opportunity to to do something that is kind of personally beneficial, which is to give up. You know, you might survive, but it's not honorable. And the way that you you motivate men is by giving them, you know, honor, by giving them something to to strive for. And these stories, these kind of these, these tales of you know, the action and extremists, you know, when when you had to do something that was difficult. They provide you, they provide you what you need to kind of act in those in those circumstances, and the kind of like the the truly like diabolical thing about how things are currently set up is that, you know, far from being recognized at least in our current moment, there's a very real likelihood you will be punished for doing the right thing, but nonetheless, it is the right, the honorable thing to do, and so I think that, you know. And I, I'm glad you told me those stories. I didn't know them. I didn't, obviously, I'm not a bore. I didn't grow up with them. But it, it kind of shows you, you know, the kind of things that you you can't expect of people, given a kind of a, a healthy understanding of, you know, honor and, and duty. And you know, those ideas aren't this kind of like cheap trash they're presented as. You know, they're not just a way to manipulate people. They're a way to have, you know, a functional, like real good civilization again. And, you know, my friend, my friend Thomas, who comes on my show often, he says this thing where he says basically that, you know, like America is a pointless civilization. It can't answer why it exists. And, you know, whether you want to say that or talk about this crisis of meaning, you know, where people have no way to justify, you know, who they are and what they do. I think that that, that sickness is born of having no heroic vision of the world. And, and one of the things that I think that you do a good job, Ernst, of, of talking about is that, you know, we are in an era of decline. You know, things are throughout our lives getting worse. They're fraying. But there is a, there's a call in that. There's an adventure in that. And when you, you view yourself in kind of this chain of men who came before you, who, who dealt with entropy, who dealt with rough situations, right, who dealt with, you know, an uncivilized continent. 
And yet we're able to build something, to create something and to, you know, undergo immense personal, uh, personal privation. Well, that's, that's exactly what we need now. You know, we are not at this kind of eternal end of history where it's just a, a slow retirement cruise for civilization. That, that is, that's not an option extended to us. And so that's why I think we need to be looking back into the past to see men, well, okay, like what did, what did our forefathers who were put in similar circumstances do? And well, am I living up to that, to that example, I guess? Hmm. No, absolutely. And the, there was a comment here that I think uh, perfectly encapsulates this, this part of the discussion. And uh, it's from uh, Stefan Jakobs who says, uh, heroes are born when duty beckons. And this is, as you correctly pointed out, something that I, I repeat over and over again, because people need to understand this. People often despair when they hear that, um, that old saying about uh, good time, uh, hard men create, uh, create good times, good times create soft men, soft men create bad times. It goes on and on and on, that cycle. But the or uh, uh, strong men and weak men, the different variants on it. When it comes to living in hard times, now I firstly just want to underscore again, as I always have to, we're not in hard times yet. Don't don't believe that for a second. And as you correctly stated, Mr. Burden, if you have any knowledge about history, you don't even have to be a history buff. You'll know. You can measure the times that we are currently living in uh, against the times in the past. And you'll know that uh, something that uh, Oren also um, often reminds his audience of is that things can get a lot worse, believe me. Um, so don't also take that uh, that saying too far and say, well, yeah, we're living in the hard times now. But when it comes to that cycle of hard times and good times, you have the opportunity during, in the good times, you have the opportunity to live a comfortable life. But during the bad times or the hard times, you not only have the opportunity to see great men and strong men come to the fore, some of historic figures that you only read about in history and some that you haven't seen around you in your time, uh, you get the opportunity to actually see or the potential to see some of those great men of history come to the fore. There's some, a greater privilege and a greater potential in, in hard times or difficult times, and that, and that is you can be a great man yourself. You can be a heroic person yourself. That doesn't mean you have to lead a nation. That doesn't mean you have to be, you have to create an institution that stands for thousands of years or hundreds of years. It just means you get a ample opportunity to be heroic, to say, I'm going to go against the grain of the times. I'm going to go against the spirits of the time. When Afrikaans, you'd say the Taitsgeus, the spirits of the time. You have an ample opportunity for that. You actually have a duty for that, as one of the comments uh, pointed out. So we should do away with this conception of heroes being born, of like you're born heroic, you're fate to be heroic. Now there is there's a conversation to be had about that that theme within ancient mythology. But at the same time, I think it's more important to underscore that heroes are created. Heroes are created by the times that they're born into. They are called to be heroes during uh, the time. If they were born in another time, they might have been just a boring accountant. If they were born during another time, they might have just been a street sweeper or a, 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 any type of a, a boring uh uh, I'm, I'm insulting some of my audience, maybe uh, just some boring office jobs. But uh, at the same time, that's not the time that uh, times that we are learning, living in currently and not the times that, that are heading our way. The times that are heading our way is going to be times where I think we're going to see some of a lot more opportunity and duty to be more than uh, you, than more than just a man or just a normal person that's you're going to be called to be more and you're going to need heroic figures to strive towards because you're not going to be able to find that heroic inspiration just in yourself you're going to have to find it in ideals that you strive towards i think that's the that's the core core at the core of the uh, of your piece as well is that we have to again re-establish those ideals and we ourselves also have to be striving towards them even if we don't reach them well, and that's one of the, the reasons that I like Thomas Carlyle so much is in that book, he goes through different men. And these are these are great men. You know, the, that theory of the great men theory of history is, is sort of, you know, lifted from from Carlyle is that he describes the, the different ways, the different kind of archetypes of a hero, because there are more than one. 
You know, like mm-hmm. not every man is Napoleon. You know, but you can look at someone like Martin Luther, you know, and even if you're Catholic, you've got to admit that that was a brave man. You know, that was a man who who truly you know, had kind of strong beliefs and was willing to kind of risk it all on that. And I think that that's that's one of the other reasons that it is so in, important to, to go back into this tradition, because when you have a rich civilizational tradition, you don't have just one type of of hero. You know, the Romans ha- had a kind of a series of, uh, you know, female heroes that, you know, Lucretia, they had, you know, all of these, these figures for women and they're distinctly female, right? They're not the same as the male heroes, but they sort of offer a kind of a competing version of like, oh, this is how you live out civic virtues. And, and one of the things that's been interesting in to watch in kind of modern media, and I don't watch much modern media because it is by and large garbage and a waste of time is that you've seen a flattening in that, you know, every hero, every, you know, regardless of their age, race, sex, or gender is, you know, a, effectively a muscle man. You know, it's a 110 pound woman who can throw punches like Arnold, you know, beats up a bunch of goons. And well, that's both kind of boring and lame because it's not true, but also because, well, how does that serve as a, you know, a realistic kind of like role model for a 110 pound woman, you know, you're not going to be out there beating up goons. You're just not, I mean, you can try, it won't go well, but when we have kind of a more complex understanding of the heroic, a more complex understanding of like what you can be in kind of a a pro-social sense, you know, you can be this kind of, you know, this, this virtuous princess who would rather, you know, die than, than, you know, give up the location of her prince, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be, you know, kind of like the Pieta, the, the mother of Christ. Like there are different ways for you to be noble at different stages, you can see that this is a this is a cohesive mesh of examples. It's not just one. And obviously, you know, the the kind of like the the leader on horseback is is the kind of the, the tip of that, the most exciting one. But it is far from the only one. You know, and I think that it, it it's also important to realize that, you know, there these kind of stations in life are natural and human. You know, every civilization has recognized this and going along with them has provided like, okay, you're a, you know, you're a young man. This is what a young man should strive to be. You know, the eight year old who won't give up his, his father. Well, if you're a man who's kind of in the, in the prime of his life, you know, a capable man, here's another example for you. And then conversely, you know, the, the kind of the sages of Rome at the end of your life, a bearded old man, you know, who, who again was, was killed by barbarians because he refused to give up his dignity and run and hide, Hmm. you know, at each stage of life, there is an example for you. And I'll speak less to, you know, the female examples because well, one, I'm not a woman. So I know, you know, kind of the stage is a little less well, but you know, in a more functional society, a society with a point, we we had a, a path mapped out for you at every, at every stage. Whereas now it's sort of like, you know, on one hand, we're this kind of like perversely obsessed with youth, you know, and the best we've got as a hero is this kind of like teenage rebel. You know, we've got this kind of like a little bit immature, kind of irreverent, you know, archetype. And okay, that's fun. You know, that can make an interesting story. It takes on authority. Right. (laughs) But that doesn't work for a whole civilization. You know, you can't have a full civilization of, you know, bandits and gangsters. And I I think that it, again, people who hate their father. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's be honest (laughs) to quote my my friend, John Slaughter, it's it's like 90% of politics is downstream of your relationship to your dad. Which is, yeah. I mean, let's be honest, just completely true, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that that's that's another element of this as well. Mm. And what also adds to what you were saying there is the fact that for the majority of our civilization, civilizations' history and across civilizations, you are steeped in these types of ideas, not just in the stories. And and we've touched a lot on myth here tonight, but not just the stories that you're told. The stories you're told by your mother while you're still a child, the stories your father tells you when you're a bit older, not just the stories you read in books from your civilization or your people, it's also in the physical world around you. What do you think statues are? What do you think the purpose of statues are? Do you really think it's just to to stroke the ego of that person that's being, uh, the statue is being erected to? Most statues are built after that person is dead. Why do you think that is? It's to remind people on as many occasions as possible, this is what you should be striving towards. You are not at this level. You should be trying to get to this level. That's what I really enjoyed about when I was uh, fortunate enough to, to visit Europe is to see how many statues there are. Not just statues of 
uh, the greatest figures in their history, statues of local heroes, local politicians, people in the past that made a difference, people that really made an impact uh, on their society, a positive one. And in South Africa, we're doing it to a, a small extent now and increasingly so, is that we're building more statues. Well, when we, I'm talking about the solidarity movement that I form part of, um, for example, at the at Soltech, the technical college that we built uh, for Afrikaans students, in the middle of the courtyard, there's a statue because it's a technical college where you learn trades. Naturally, there's a statue there that celebrates the influence of the tradesman as a figure, as an archetype throughout the Afrikaners history. But this is something it, it confronts those students every day that they walk into that courtyard as they go to class. They are confronted by that statue. And that's that's what statues are for to a large extent, is to remind people again about the great men and women of the past and the influence that they had on their society and that you should be striving towards that. And there's so many other examples. This is just uh, just the tip of the iceberg. But it comes down to that point, that conversation that... Um, uh Carl Benjamin and um uh, uh the distributors had Dave on his channel where they talked about we just need to start building statues again but it it, it touches on the same point we need to start uh, uh celebrating heroes again that's the bedrock on what, what all these conversations or these topics rest on your piece included that conversation included well definitely and you know the the converse of that you know, idea that, that, you know, hero worship is the basis of civilization is that essentially the basis of the civilization is its heroes, right? And so I, I say that not to be too redundant, but to kind of shore up your point in the sense that, you know, a destruction of, you know, a culture's heroes. And in the American context, this is visceral. You see this, they, they kind of gleefully do this, is a destruction of that civilization. You know, they're, they're willfully kind of breaking up the fabric of that that previous order and uh, that's why you know this matters more than just the you know oh the the, the the aesthetics of it although the aesthetics are important you know that that famous statue of, of lee it, it's sort of emblematic of the whole thing because you know when i lived there they they had the statue there you know covered in graffiti they had homeless people sleeping there you know it was kind of this totemic symbol of evil and then they tore it down broke down the the beautiful marble plinth and replaced it with a pile of dirt, literally just a, a mud pile. And again, that's sort of emblematic of all of it. It's like you take this away and you have created the, the fulfillment of your idea that, you know, we are just beasts. You've done it. You know, it didn't have to be this way, but you made it true. And again, it's why that, that needs to be. We're resisted. all just a collection of atoms, just like this, this pile of dirt. No yeah, exactly. Right. The, it's almost like. The two. <laughs> I couldn't ask for a more beautiful symbol of what I'm talking about than what you did. You know, not a curse you are, but yeah. these kind of gender goblins who pulled it I'm down. sorry to interrupt you there, but it's very eerie that that's what happened there because that's exactly what happened at, in the, at the birthplace of this whole anti-statue movement. A lot of people don't know. It all started in South Africa. I don't want to be one of those guys that pretends his... Uh, region or his country is the center of the world when it comes to every trend but that trend literally started in south africa with the toppling of Rhodes' statue at the university of cape town and then it spread to england and then it bounced over to america but they replaced Rhodes' statue at uct with a pile of rubble i saw a photograph of the other of it the other day and i couldn't believe it but they did exactly what you're describing with almost you said it's the perfect it's the perfect symbol but it seems almost like eerie that it, it happened twice even to such a such a minute detail well, well definitely and there's an extent to which you know south africa was this sort of test tube society for the american mm -hmm. progressive establishment you know it's well, no if, secret uh, if, that... uh, if afghanistan is the the graveyard of empires then south africa is the laboratory of empires uh, cer cer certainly right and you know it's no accident that in the kind of like you know, tarot deck of, you know, like liberal causes of the last century, mm -hmm. right? It was like in, in no particular order, uh, you know, anti-apartheid, anti-nuclear, you, you know, this kind of like laundry list. And that was always one of them. And, you know, I, I think that that's no accident. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the same things that we have, we have seen in, in your country are, are sort of coming here 
And in many cases, it's because they're designed by the same people. You're just be, perfecting be them. You're taking what, what uh, we're experimenting uh, with. Perfecting and... is, is an interesting way to describe it. But we're, we're getting a, a modified version, certainly. I don't know to whose interest. But actually, sorry, I want to go back to the example mm. of that statue of Lee. Yeah. yeah. Because that... yeah, sorry for interrupting you there. No, 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 not at all. The, the, I... the resemblance was just too eerie. I don't know if you could hear it over the well, microphone. And that's why it I want to bring a very this nice up. Uh, high felt thunderstorm coming in right now. I hope for a production value, it does come over the microphone. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Well, sorry, the reason I want to bring this up, this next point, is because I want to see if the converse is true. I want to see if this has happened as well. So in, in that area, Monument Avenue was this, this kind of collection of statues to... Uh, Southern American figures. Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. It was also a very wealthy area. And you know, the Southern American aristocracy was absolutely gutted by this war. They lost many, many men. They lost the vast majority of their wealth. Uh, and so, you know, these were massive civic projects from poor people, you know, people who had been impoverished but wanted to honor their dead. And so all the way down Monument Avenue, which despite still being called Monument Avenue, has no monuments. You know, every block or so, there's a statue. You know, there's the big circle with Lee. There's Jeb Stewart up from him, you know, kind of so on and so forth. And they've completely taken them down. There's there's none left. But just kind of around the corner near the, the art museum, there's the one vaguely human statue that is still allowed. And That's it is not the, some just abstract shape that nobody can discern what it is. Yes, exactly. And it is too. It is by the same guy who did Obama's uh, presidential portrait. It's a famous portrait of him in front of this kind of like garish African pattern. But it's a statue and it's a deliberate mockery of the statue of Lee. And it is just a random black dude in a hoodie on a horse, a symbol of basically nobody, of nothing other than just sheer resentment. You know, like we hate you. So we made this kind of mockery of you and it means nothing past that. So have there been that kind of similar like subversions or kind of mirror images of traditional art? Or is that something we've only got here? No, that's that's an example of you perfecting it. <laughs> no, and in South Africa, uh, I can't remember anything like that happening. Um, as a uh, sideliner opinions uh, points out here, the Mona Lisa was attacked this week. But remember, sideliner, it, it's just a painting. So when it comes to uh, that phenomenon that you're describing, Jay Bird, and um, no, uh, we, we've not uh, we've not reached that stage. It's just destruction at the moment. I can't think there's a no. That's it's not that new. There's just a the the statues that the the ANC or the ruling party in South Africa are just caught in this Cold War loop of well, firstly just calling every each other comrade and talking about all these abstract like soviet theories of like the national democratic revolution and the balance of forces their vocabulary is stuck there and they're also just caught in this death loop of just being able to build statues of their past heroes but not even a wide array of anc figures just nelson mandela over and over again so no nothing on that level of just building a statue of a random guy but uh, maybe maybe the 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 government in South Africa just hasn't thought about it that deeply. Well, and, and that statue of the the random guy, and you know, in my discussion of with with academic agent a while back on my show, he talked about this town in the UK called called Woking, which has a similar thing. You know, it's a, it's sort of a shopping mall of a town, and it has these these statues of effectively just random people, but posed up like they are you know, figures of note, but they're just, right. you know, a random model in sweatpants and a hoodie. And yeah, that's, that's sort of, I think, how we know that it's more than just like, oh, they don't like, you know, our particular heroes because of the reasons they say, you know, they really have a bone to pick with that idea of heroism, that idea of merit, because they, they will deliberately ape that form, but use it to promote the ordinary, right. you know, the normal guy, the just a normal guy. And I think that that's really revealing and it's something not to forget because I, I kind of conceptualized this whole thing. And this is an idea I, I lift from my, you know, my, my friend and mentor, Dave, the distributor, is that this is a war of belief. You know, this is a war of kind of fundamental assumptions about the way of the world. This is not, you know, the era of the post-war consensus and where, you know, it was just a disagreement about, you know, marginal tax rates or, you know, what to do with, with farm tariffs. Like this is a truly a civilizational struggle and 
you see that in what they are willing to promote and what they're willing to attack. And they're willing to promote their kind of ersatz fake civilization, and they're willing to attack the remains of a, of a living one. And I think that, that that truly defines, you know, what a group is, which is, you know, who they're willing to attack and who they're, they're willing to kind of promote, I guess. Mm. Well, I love how you've tied it back now. I mean, we, our topic of conversation has now for a while been just the, the relation between statues and the, the heroic, but I mean, the way you've tied it back now is absolutely perfect where that's the type of statues that you describe that they're building now. It's just statues to your just a normal guy. So we're going to, if statues, as we established, are the things that you should aspire towards, the heroic or the, the type of figures that you should have at the back of your mind when you think about what I want to be, building a statue of just a guy in a hoodie on a on a on a horse is literally just sending the message you should be fighting to be or striving to be a normal guy that should be the the pinnacle that that man standing at top of the top of the mountain he's just a normal guy and you should be trying to be that normal guy it's it's very strange and and eerie how it how it all fits together now now that we've brought it full circle to here no, definitely. And and this is why, just to kind of zoom out a little, I really enjoy mm -hmm. these kind of interview podcasts, even if it's a topic that I've already covered before, because I have, a, this is an essay that I talked about or anyway, because you sort of get to workshop these ideas and see, you know, kind of greater significant than you got your kind of first, mm -hmm. first run around. And so uh, this was an invaluable discussion. I, I really do appreciate it. Mm. Well, I always put the disclaimer here that my there's a big difference between my live content and my written content, and that is in the written content, I've actually put a lot of, lot of thought in. This is more exploring ideas. Some of the ideas here are half-baked, and uh, I often turn live streams into essays later, but that's when I can take some of these ideas and actually put some re assault them really with some, some thorough thought. Um, but that's it's it's invaluable to me as well in that regard. Um, so we're approaching the, the end now. I wanted to read just uh, one passage from your piece, maybe to give a little bit of a an appetizer for people that want to go read it after the stream and just want to get some of your final thoughts in that regard. But this is one of my favorite uh, parts of your essay, except for the, uh, the final part, but I don't want to read the final part. I'd rather have people go read the, the conclusion for themselves. So you wrote that uh, the word just, just does a lot of heavy lifting for progressive social entropy. You find this phrase littered through progressive spaces online and in print, and Reddit reminds you that you're just a brain piloting a bone mech covered in meat. Neil deGrasse Tyson reminds you that you're just a speck of matter in the infinite nothingness of an uncaring universe, and love is just a chemical reaction in your brain. Now, I wanted to highlight that passage because it brings us all the way back to where this conversation started of all these Redditisms, all these deGrasse Tysonisms of just, just, just. And it brings me to my final question to you, Mr. Burden, and that is, a more practical question, just a distilled answer of what is there to be done about this? You, we've identified the problem, we've described it, we've done a 3D model of the problem, we've scanned it, we've uh, wrote a thesis on the problem, but now we have to get to work and actually do something about it. What's your, what would your your remedy or your prescription be in that regard? Well, well to, to kind of paraphrase Jonathan Bowden, it's to step over it. You know, this is these sort of attacks are not, and we've, we've beaten this to death, but they're not good faith. You know, this is not someone who is concerned about historical accuracy. It's someone who wants to destroy civilization and, and view them as such, you know, and, and just in the same way that, you know, you wouldn't accept, you know, weapons from your enemy before you go out into battle. You know, you wouldn't trust them for that. Why, why do you trust these people's history? Why do you trust the, the narratives they produce? Because you have better alternatives. You know, you have this this great tradition behind you, full of examples for you, full of examples for your children, for your family, and you can pull from that. You know, we have plenty, plenty of heroes. We have plenty of narratives that you can use to kind of fill up your life with. You know, again, like you can't deny that. That is a part of what it is to be human. And again, the, the current examples to hand, you know, the kind of modern examples are poison and deliberately so. And so essentially it is one, you know, stop accepting, you know, narratives from your enemy, stop accepting the weapons they handed you to fight them. 
And then also just step over this kind of petty squabbling, step over the, you know, the man who says, oh, well, you know, Jefferson had a relationship with a slave. And so we, we throw out everything he ever did, you know, step over the man that says, well, Napoleon was this weird sort of incel simp, like step over it because it's not real. It's not true to them. It is, it is a, a, a weapon they are preparing to hurt you with. And again, like I said, this is an attack on the kind of bedrock of, of civilization and you know, the, these people are truly, and I mean this not in the kind of like hyperbolic sense, but they're on a satanic mission. They're on a mission of inversion. They're on a mission of pure entropy. And uh, once you've accepted that truth, why do you give their opinions any weight whatsoever? They're, they're truly despicable in their, in their outlook on life. And once you've accepted that, well, I don't really care what a despicable man thinks. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a powerful place to end it. Incidentally, the storm has just picked up out here. I don't know if you can hear it over the over the microphone, but yeah, it's a, a typical high felt thunderstorm here. Nice summer rain here in the city of Pretoria. Uh, Jay Burden, thank you very much for your your time and your insights. And uh, my last question to you is not a theoretical question, but rather just a practical question. Where can people find you if they want to hear more about uh, hear some more of your thoughts, some of your more uh, not half baked, but fully baked thoughts, and uh, where can they find some of your thoughts all across the spectrum? Sure, my my main output is the Jay Burden Show. It's twice a week, hourly or hour long interview show. Uh, if you've listened to this podcast, it's a very similar format. There's only so many ways to talk to people on the internet, but I've talked to lots of people you have heard of. I've, I've talked to Ernst a few months back. Hopefully, we'll have him on again soon. But just recently, I've, I've talked to Ed Dutton, Andrew Isker, one of the, the big Christian nationalists, you know, any number of, of people you're interested in hearing from. I also have my sub stack, which you can is also under the Jay Burden show, where I you know, rough, roughly once a week or so uh, post a, an essay on, on something that's important to me. They're all free. You know, I, you can just read them. I, I don't try to paywall them. You can pretty much find whatever you want there. And uh, those are the two easiest ways to find me. I'm also on Twitter, but I'm not going to recommend that to anyone. Twitter in general is a colossal waste of time. And so, yeah, you should you should check me out as a as a podcaster and as a writer first and foremost. Ernst, I believe you're muted. Yeah, one second. I was just uh, checking if I can minimize some of the sound here from my side, but it doesn't seem like it's possible. But I think the timing is is perfect now. Thank you very much, uh, Jay Burden. Thank you for uh, uh, sharing some of your insights. And for those that are too lazy to go uh, uh, type in what you have uh, what you described there, there's links to everything in the description. Go check it out and it will be well worth your time. And uh, we can chat again on your channel anytime when, uh, when you can fit me in. So uh, my last thank you is just to the, the audience. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for sharing this content. And uh, thank you for uh, all your questions and comments during the show. I love putting them on the screen, making them part of the content. It adds just another layer of depth to the conversation and to the, the broader topic. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you as, as well also for those that uh, tune in that when it's no longer live, but still put their thoughts in the comment section. I read all of them, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for that. And uh, then lastly, um, thank just the last thank you to my guest again, Jay Burden. Thank you for your insights, and uh, I hope to uh, chat to you again real soon. And good luck with all of your creative and content creating endeavors in the year ahead. And uh, you're striving to be more heroic. Yes, thank you very much. All right, cheers, guys. Have a good one, and God bless.